few places in the world are seeing the explosion of God's power like the underground church in China is experiencing. And in the last 60 years, China's communist government has done its best to wipe Christianity off the map. What you are about to see is some of the rarest footage on the planet. In this church, the people wake up at 4.30 to come together for two hours to pray and worship. They do this every day. This church meets in the only place they are safe, a cave. This church meets on a farm, far away from prying eyes. Here's an example of an underground church outreach. The people sitting are Christians. The people who are standing are not. This particular preacher was once crippled, but was healed when someone prayed for her. She now preaches the good news of Jesus to anyone who will listen. In this particular meeting, over 1,000 people became Christians. Here Christians cast out demons from an 18-year-old girl. She's now a preacher. In Shanghai alone, there are over 3,000 house churches, just like this one. One thing Dennis pointed out to me was that most of the underground churches in China are actually led by young people. These kids have all come out of the communist system, and they want nothing to do with it. They only want to spread the love of Jesus to everybody they meet. This is a music school. Well, that's the cover anyway. It's really a training school for students who want to be pastors. The government thinks they're simply learning to play instruments. One thing I quickly realized about the Chinese church is that it's a lot different from the American one. For one thing, they think a four-hour sermon is short. In this church service, it's 120 degrees inside the building. The people meet for 12 hours straight. Dennis told me one story about a time he went to a very remote village in China to preach. He was led into a large room where the people were packed so closely together that he had his back to the wall and could reach out and touch the row in front of him. Everyone stood. There was no room to sit. He asked how long he should preach for, and they told him from 8.30 to 7 at night. Then they asked him, if it wasn't too much trouble, could you come back tomorrow and preach from 8.30 to 7 again? And then, very sheepishly, they asked again, if you'd be so kind, could you come back the day after that and preach from 8.30 to 7? He asked how often he should take breaks, and they told him not to stop. The people will wait. Then he asked them what he should preach on. Everything, they replied, from Genesis to Revelation. And then it dawned on him, these people had no Bibles. I went to Asia because I thought, man, I've always heard about the underground church in China. I want to see it. And I was blown away. And I go, wow, that looks just like what I read about. It finally makes sense. Then I went to India. And I spoke at a conference for the persecuted church, people who had lost their lives, or no, they had not lost their lives, their, their relatives, they watched their relatives die, people that were missing limbs, people with scars on their body, beaten for their faith. And I'm, I, I was so blown away that I asked the leader, because after a, a week there, I'm going, it seems like everyone's serious about God here. Where are the casual ones? There's got to be. And he, he says, well, actually, there aren't. He goes, that doesn't make sense in this region. Why would you casually become a Christian? You lose everything. You lose your job, you lose your home, you get ostracized from your village. Look at all these people. They had to flee into the, the jungles for their lives. Why would you casually do that? I thought, wow. 
Man, when I was at the underground church in China, okay, they, they, they said it's a little dangerous. You know, this one, this is where they're training some of the missionaries. And so I didn't take my whole family. I just took my oldest daughter because she's the most expendable. And uh, <laughs> so we go and, um, you know, firstborn. And so we go and, man, I wish, I wish I could transport you there. I wish you could have just walked into this environment and listened to the way they prayed. Listen to the way they sought after God. Listen to their testimonies. They start talking about different times when the police came after them because they were, you know, gunshots, and they're just talking about, not in this solemn way, but with joy. Like, man, it was awesome. They were firing us, and we're running, you know. And, and, and I'm just wanting to hear more and more and more. And they finally asked me, of course, and they're like, why are you so interested in this? And I said, because this is not the way it is in America. And they're like, really? I go, in America, we have these buildings called churches. And, and we actually just attend there for like an hour, hour and a half a week. And, and we switch, like if there's a better speaker at a different one, we'll go to that one. And if there's better music at another one, we'll go to that one. If we get in a fight with someone, we'll switch to this one. If the child care is better. And these people just start laughing. Not like giggling, but like hysterically. And I wasn't trying to be funny. I was just explaining why it was so intriguing to me. I go, this is, but they were literally laughing to the where my, my daughter, when we left, she was, uh, I don't know, what, 16 or so, 14. Um, she says to me, Dad, that was weird. I go, I know. She goes, did you see the way they were laughing and you weren't even being funny? I go, exactly. But they thought it was comical because they're going, how did you get that from this? How, how did you get there? And you start realizing that the majority of the world, well, you know, for me in the States, going, man, they're actually, they actually find what I call or we call their Christianity laughable because the lack of congruency from this book, because we keep changing things. After the death of Mao Zedong, the Chinese people, cheated by a false god, began to search for the true god. For the first time in their lives, people from the lowest levels of society came face to face with God's unconditional love, with Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and with the knowledge that in God's temple they had value and dignity. How could they not rejoice, like everyone who has received the most precious gift in the world? The first time I went to church, I felt the atmosphere there was really good. I found true meaning in life. I found a peace that I never felt before, peace in the Lord. So I can say without reservation, I will follow God for the rest of my life. After the service, my soul felt especially sweet and joyful. Lord, how wonderful it will be if we can meet like this every day. I lay away for three nights, overwhelmed with joy. I thought, Lord, what have I received? Why am I so filled with joy? I have no money. I have no family. I have nothing. 
And you know, I was absolutely sure that this joy came from heaven.